So spare parts are the lifeblood of any race team, especially at this level, the alcohol level and, and above for sure. Uh, you just chew up a lot of parts. It's just the, uh, the nature of the beast. So we've had spare parts for years. I've, I've had spare rods and pistons and all kinds of parts. These are rods that are all uh, ready to go. Uh, they can go in the motor with pistons and rings, brand new rings that are all cut. Everything's fitted to the motor, ready to go. So I've had this for a long time, uh, spare racks. I've had that. I've had spare crankshafts. I've had spare blocks. I've had spare everything. What I've not had, is, since I've been doing this since what? Let's see, this is the 2000s. Oh, I don't know, since 1903 or the mid 90s when I started this. I've never ever raced at a racing track with my car and had in the trailer a spare motor. I've never had that. After 20 years of running a safe fuel car, I can tell you with great pride that for the first time ever, I went to a racing track, I went to Woodburn and at the Fall Classic and we had a spare motor. So we hauled that and thankfully we didn't need it, but we had it and that's the first time I've ever had one. So that's a complete short block. So there's a lot of little trinkets I've had to buy to get to here and we went to the track and had a spare motor. So now we've come home, it's the end of the season, it's time to start servicing our stuff. So we've got the car in the shop and, and we've had it all apart and took the rack out, took the rods and pistons out because we're going to get new connecting rods. Okay, then I had this thought um, and it was really born from my, I don't like having my car sit bleeding oil all winter long with parts everywhere and not together. I like having my car together. I get customers through once in a while. I get friends through every great once in a while that like to see the car. And they don't want to see a chassis. They don't want to see a bare chassis. They don't want to see parts strewn everywhere. They want to see a race car together. So I prefer to have it together. So I'm in there looking at this block and there's nothing in it and it's all empty and I had this flash. Hey, wait a minute. We've got a spare motor. I got an idea. We have never done a motor swap because we never had one to swap, so we never needed to. What if we were to put that thing back together, just mocked up, put the heads back on, put the manifold back on, connect everything back up, and then we set a day here in the weeks to come where I could take the car out, put it beside the trailer here in my shop, which it fits inside my warehouse, and set it up like we were at the track. And then I've got this big timer and we'll push go and we start counting and see how long it would take us to do a motor swap. And we'll push the done button right as soon as we put that motor in and start the car. So it'll be concluded once that motor's in and it's running in the car. So we've talked about it, the guys and I've talked about it and we think that's gonna be a hoot. So we're gonna do that and Dana's gonna help us with a video on that and I don't know how we're gonna do a time lapse or, or live or what we're gonna do, but we're gonna do something cool. And if you guys are interested in this at all, you need to check that out because it's gonna be a hoot. So what's the typical progression for somebody trying to work through a race car then? I have no idea. Um, I just know about my little corner of the world and teams that I've been involved in. Typically a new guy starts as the grunt or the effing new guy, and which is Josh just raised his hand. Hey, effing new guys. He's a new guy. And Josh owns his own automotive shop, so he's not exactly a dummy. He, he knows more about cars than, he's forgotten more about cars than I'll ever know. <laughs> and that's a fact. However, I happen to know this much, which is a lot, about this much, which is really narrow. And that would be if you've got an injected nitro hemi, I'm your guy. Me and a handful of other people on the planet, we know a fair amount. And I, I know quite a bit about injected nitro hemis. It's just that's a really narrow slice of the automotive <laughs> world. But thankfully, it's this slice. It's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So it kind of matters that somebody ought to know something about this stuff, and I'm the guy. Oh and it's just i've done it a long time so where do people start they start as the new guy the grunt and that typically is frankly washing parts what i want is somebody that knows lefty loosey righty tighty that's really good to know i want somebody that knows the difference between coarse and fine threads that's good to know I actually had one one time that didn't uh, that was a problem tore up a bunch of stuff um, and from there, what, what they need to have is a passion for motorsports and hopefully injected nitro drag racing. Because if they have that, they're willing to pay the price because it's expensive. And I don't mean so much financially, but I mean time and heart and energy and effort because you just work your tail off in this. It's a lot of work. And if you add it all up, 
I mean, I don't care how many times you run the car, if you run the car 20 times, 30 times, 50 times, but do the math. The car runs low five second quarter miles times 20. That's not a lot of run time in a given year for which we bust our tails a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work. So I'll show you what I'm looking for. <clears throat> When he laps the valve, I'm looking for this, this dark gray area here, that circle that goes all the way around. If you had the right view, you could see it went all the way around. But I need that band to be that wide all the way around on both the exhaust and then on the intake, I need it to be that way. If you find one that, if we had a, this is the exhaust, this is the exhaust seat, that's the intake seat. If we had an exhaust seat where we did have that porcelain go through that we talked about earlier, then that valve would pinch it right there in that seat between the valve and the seat, and it would leave a divot. If we couldn't get that out, or it had done it in a manner where you couldn't get this to lap in, then that has to be repaired because you can't get that seal up. If you don't have this band, then it's telling you it's not sealing in whatever area you don't have that band. So I'm looking for that in every one of them. We were at Woodburn last time and we're running out of daylight. We'd, we'd gone 551, 44, 39, and we knew that 39 had numerous problems. It should have been a 20, would have, could have, should have mean nothing. We had one more try, we're running out of time. We'd leak the motor, put air in the cylinder, measure what comes out. A low number is good, tight cylinder, it's not going anywhere. A high number is very bad. What we're really looking for is, does it go to 100? because that means you've torched a cylinder head. You have removed metal. The aluminum is gone, typically, to a pushrod hole, which are these holes right here where the pushrods go through, and it will literally remove the aluminum. It'll be gone right there. Well, that's gonna leak 100%. You can't run that. So, we're at Woodburn last time for the Fall Classic. We leak the motor. And number two, the last one we check in sequence, uh, leaks 85. 80 freaking five. Now, should we run that? Of course not. No, we shouldn't run it. We should tear it apart, figure out where it's going. It's either going out the valves or it's going by the rings, unless we've torched it, but I don't think we've torched it or it'd go to 100. I know this because I've done it a lot. It ain't torched, but it's going somewhere. I don't have time to fix it. We either tow it up there and run it or we put it in the trailer. Which do you want to do? And if we put it in the trailer, it's going in there for six months, not six weeks or six hours. So this is it, Buck. You want to run it now or you want to put it away? Run it. So I made some adjustments and we went and ran it. And it was our best time of the year. It went 528 with a six, dropping two cylinders, not that one. Uh, two more it was a tune-up mistake I made because I'd added fuel and it put a couple cylinders out. So if I could have kept those lit, yeah, could have, would have, should have, I know, but it's something we console ourselves with anyway, then I know that it would have been at between 22 no, and 25. You know, so one of the things that I do for crew guys, uh, it's important to me that they feel like they're part of the program, that, that they're part of something bigger than themselves, and I want them to feel like they matter. So I do a, a, a bunch of little things to that end. And sidebar, the reason I do this is because I was a crew guy 127 years ago, it was a long time ago, but I was a crew guy. And I remember what it was like when on different teams, um, the prevailing attitude was, you are doggone lucky we let you touch our car, you ignorant bastard. <laughs> and you're just lucky that we let you in this room and to breathe the air in this room. You're darn lucky. Um, I've had tools thrown at me, uh, hand the wrong tool to somebody, and I've had air tools thrown at me. I always vowed that if I ever had a racing team, God, this goes back a long ways. If I ever had a racing team, I would try, and I'm not perfect, I don't walk on water, I mean, you fill the bathtub, I'll sink to the bottom quicker than anybody. <laughs> I try diligently, I purpose in my heart to try diligently to make these guys feel like they are an integral part of the program, because they are. So for Chris, I'm making his own notepad. Oh, very nice. Yeah, and it's just a goofy little notepad, and it's a stupid little thing, I get it, but you just try to swing at the ball and make people feel like they're a part and that they matter to you, that you care whether they live or die for who they are, not just what they can do for you. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so this is a brand new degree wheel I just bought and it matches that part that I'm pointing to right here on the car. So this is a spare, one of those. And I'm showing you this to show you that this is the red, this is the black, those are pickups. And what they're picking up is the magnet. So I've turned this on its back, it's on the car like this, turn its back and you see those four diamonds there, those are the magnets. So all those pickups are looking for is when that magnet goes by and it tells it to fire now, 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 each time that magnet goes by, it tells it to fire. So it's, it's a very reliable method for firing the ignition. When I started, we actually had, this is so incredible, on the mag drive it had these piston devices called BIMBAs, these pneumatic pistons that would physically rotate the generators, the mags, and you can set it with a feeler blade at every, it seemed to me like every 17 thousandths was one degree. So at, at a certain time in the run, it would go psh, 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 and it would advance or retard, whatever you're trying to do, the timing. It was so archaic, uh, and to, so to look at that now is just laughable. Then we moved to another method that used these chips called the six shooter, and that worked pretty well. There's a car that I know that runs really well that still uses one of those. It just blows my mind that they can run that fast with that. Most of us have moved on to a new device called a command module, and that's up here in the cockpit. Uh, made by Electromotion, a guy named Dave Leahy, who's, I swear he's got four-digit IQ, these guys are brilliant. But they make a device now that takes this ignition signal from the uh, crank trigger, goes into that box, and now it gives me up to 15 different intervals where I can change the ignition timing up to 15 times in the five-second run. So we can leave the starting line with less power and as it gains momentum, we can pour the coals to it and start increasing the lead. If there's a bad place in the racetrack, at a particular track, we can go out there and say, well, that, that's a bad area. We can pull the power out and put it back in once we get past it. So you all actually make adjustments based on the track itself. The track, the time of day, the weather, hemorrhoidal flare up. I mean, you would be amazed at what we adjust for. Yeah, crap, we adjust for everything. Because we're trying to apply every, we're trying to make as much horsepower as we can and then apply it as fast as you possibly can. And then the question is, how fast is that? What will it take? And you don't know till you try. And you either succeeded or you didn't. And you come back and say, well, it would have held more. Or what? that didn't work. It didn't hold that at all. And you try it again. Candidly, the tuning is what I've really enjoyed. It's so challenging trying to figure out what this thing wants and what it doesn't want. Because I tell you, there's a lot of us tuners that think, you know, you really ought to care about this. This is going to really matter. And it goes, I could possibly care less. If I stayed up late and studied for the test, I couldn't care less. So trying <laughs> to figure out what it cares about and what it doesn't. Jerry describes it as separa <laughs> separating the pepper flakes from the fly crap. And that's a lot of what we do because they look a lot alike. Injected nitro car, this type of car, is the most dangerous car in all of motorsports just to start. It's more dangerous than top fuel, even. And why is that? Because of the nitro and the combination we have. So nitromethane does not need a spark in order to start. So the danger is this. After you run the car, the motor's warm. So you've got heat, the motor's warm. Uh, when we get back, the motor is full of fuel because you just ran it. So all the lines are full, there's fuel left over in the cylinders. So we go through a process called windmilling to get to purge all that fuel out. So the guys will take the fuel lines off of the from the back of the motor and disassemble some other lines. They'll blow air through the ball that we can that we can purge that way. Then we take the spark plugs out and we'll turn, put the starter back on the motor with no spark plugs in it, spin the motor over, and use the pistons then to pump any excess fuel out of the spark plug holes to purge it, to windmill it. That makes the motor safe. I've heard of teams refer to it as, let's make the motor safe. That's their vernacular. We just call it windmilling. But you have to windmill the motor. Now it's safe, now you can work on it. You do not want to touch the motor, work on it, do anything, until you've made it safe, windmilled it. Now you can work on a motor, do whatever you want, because there's no fuel in it. But here's the danger. 
with that manifold, uh, in fact, I will show you. Here's the challenge right here. So this is the line that feeds the nitro to the motor. This is connected here to the barrel valve. Fuel goes into this and then down to the motor. These lines here are what feed the cylinder heads. Okay, and then the, the motor also gets fuel through here and through these nozzles here. Okay, here, here's where the challenge comes in. There are, are cars that in the old days didn't know what was happening, didn't understand the difference, and they would have this line plumbed where it would have a low spot in it. So they'd have it plumbed differently, but it could have a low spot. So if you left this connected, and then you would tow your car to the, and it has, so it has fuel in it now, and we used to warm them up on nitro, we don't do that anymore either. So we would start them on nitro to warm them up, now we gotta go run the car. Well, if you don't have time to windmill it between warm up and running, this is full of fuel again. Mm. You're supposed to windmill it, and, and oftentimes they would. But here's the challenge. If this line has fuel in it, and it's got a low spot in it, and now we tow the car to the starting line at a track where there's a hill in route to the starting line. And there's a lot of tracks like that. Seattle's like that, Sonoma's like that. They're not all like Woodburn where they're all flat. You tow the race car up the hill and it pitches it up enough that now that fuel that's sitting in this line runs down through the open nozzles and it will find one cylinder where the intake valve happens to be open. Some of them happen, happen to be open. Right. And all it takes is one shot glass full of nitro. That's it. To make its way into that motor. So now you have heat, motor's warm, mm -hmm. and compression. And as soon as you pull that trigger on the starter to turn it over, to, 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 you haven't even pulled the ignition yet. Just try to start it on alcohol. And it will come up against that nitro compress and it'll kaboom. It's happened on this car before I bought it, and it lifted the intake manifold, the, the scoop off the car 50 feet, with the intake manifold up, bit the cylinder head. 50 feet? Hold on, I just want to make sure I heard that right. True story. And I know this because Jerry's one told me, and he had crew guys that were hurt because of it, had, had ear damage because of it. Yeah, I bet. And it bit the cylinder head in a V because of it, so it causes significant damage. It's never happened to me, however, I came really close once, we, and it, it's never one thing. It's always a series of events that will get you out of your sequence. like the video please tell us if you don't that's okay too tell us that we'd like to know what y'all think of what we're doing because we're trying really hard to make good content so if you've got an idea something we haven't thought of let us know what would you like to see what would you like to hear about because oh, crap i'll share about anything except for some eh, some of the detail too that i may not share but but there's a lot of this i'll be happy to share so if you've got a question about how this stuff works let me know let me see if i can answer it for you